So um, this is going to be a reasonably quick run through on uh, what Stereo Games are about, and uh, what Neil wants to do really is get us over there and allow you guys to ask us questions. I'm sure you've had enough PowerPoint slides for the day. Uh, this is just uh, the idea that stereo really uh, requires a little bit of, of belief. You have to believe that you're going to see stereo or you can't. And, uh, and I know that sounds facetious, but it's not meant to be. Um, if you approach it with the idea that it's going to look awful, uh, it's going to look awful. Absolutely. And uh, if you really want the latest and the greatest and the most effective stereo, this is what you have to do. So uh, real quick, um, we do market research. We've been doing it for quite some time. Uh, we put out uh, bi-weekly reports and uh, we do consulting for the major companies that build the chips for graphics boards and uh, create the software uh, that is used to develop all the games. So we're really immersed in this and, and have been for quite some time. So, so we're looking at lots of changes and opportunities in the market. and. Um, <coughs> Hardware is now capable, it actually has been capable for quite some time. There still is a residual um, skepticism about what has been done in the past. I'll speak about that in a little bit. Uh, but this represents an opportunity and a challenge for everybody in the sales pipeline. And I emphasize the sales pipeline because there's almost no technical challenges left. Uh, I put this chart up because it is illustrative of what has happened and how people are trying to project the future. And uh, I think yeah, the colors work. So the green represents um, movies that had no sound. And as you can see, that was the introduction of movies, and it started quite some time ago. And as soon as sound came, the non-sound movies almost disappeared. And then uh, when color came, Black and white movies almost disappeared. We still make a few black and white movies for special dramatic effects, but primarily I think 98% of all movies today are color. And so if you look at the yellow line, that represents the movies with stereo, or as they call them, 3D. And everybody thought, or at least hoped, that history would repeat itself, and that with this new uh, technology, it would replace everything that had come before. Now, obviously that didn't happen. Um, I should have put the last part of that line as a dot because uh, it's, it's a speculation that we're going to have that kind of growth. And if you've been here for the entire conference, you've heard three days of people explaining their rationalization for that speculation. However, the one market that I think really will take off uh, is PC games or stereo. And, uh, you can see here that uh, PC games have had some starts and failures as well. We've actually started PC games in stereo uh, a little bit before 1996. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and it was crude and it was awkward and uh, it was painful at times as well. And so that experience uh, chased everybody away. When we made the transition from CRTs to LCDs, we then had a barrier with regard to whether or not we could do stereo. And it wasn't until actually this year, with the introduction of 120 hertz uh, monitors, that we were actually capable to deliver a reasonable stereo experience. And since that's now going to be the production standard, 120 hertz monitors, uh, that now there's no longer a reason for us not to have stereo. So what we come down to is the uh, penetration of the market will be a function of the trade-out uh, of people making from their old monitors, 60 hertz type, to the new 120 hertz, and however long that takes, that will be the gaining factor with regard to how fast the market takes off. Just a little historical note here. Uh, this is how I got my start in stereo, way back, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but quite a few years ago. And uh, this is a, a stereo projector. Uh, what we did in those days is we flew over the land, and we took photographs looking straight down with 60% overlap, and then we brought those photographs back, put them into that machine, and projected a stereo image on the, on the surface there. And that's the mechanism that was used, and still is used, for creating all the highways, in, or all the modern highways in the United States from 1950, and all the modern highways in Europe and other parts of Asia as well. And it was the make terrain maps so that you could see where the roads would go around mountains and things. So that stereo has been with us for quite some time. Uh, today, we're uh, looking at stereo through glasses. 
the previous thing had special glasses also that you had to look at. And uh, you heard someone speak earlier today about the glasses war. And uh, I don't know if it's a war or not, but there certainly is a lot of contention about which one's best. Um, I think what's going to happen is not one of them is going to win. That the people will choose them on the basis of availability and the basis of price, uh, as long as the content is not classes dependent. Classes weren't always the choice. <clears throat> when we first started doing uh, stereo experiments in computers, and I, I participated in some of these projects, um, we, we, we had to deal with what we had uh, available to us in terms of technology, and so we came up with these oddball looking things. The, uh, the picture up there uh, of the uh, scientist looking at a monitor, uh, that's probably been the most successful and certainly the most widely deployed approach for stereo, and it is the model for which uh, stereo games are based as well. So we went from that type of glasses, which was developed by um, Stereo Graphics Corporation, later acquired by Real 3D, and then we, as you can see, evolved to that, which was the first low-cost shutter glasses, and now we have these, and we also have passive glasses from IZ3D. Now, what can you play on today? Well, <clears throat> you have to have a screen, and, um, and the screen has to be something that's fast enough that it will support twice the frame rate of what you'd like to look at. And what we found through uh, experimentation is that you'd like to look at 60 hertz uh, per second for the most comfort. Therefore, your monitor has to be able to refresh itself at least 120 times a second to give you that level of comfort. Now, we had CRTs that would run as fast as 80 hertz, and so that got us to a 40 hertz per eye frame rate, and that was okay for a little while. And by a little while, I mean a little while, uh, a little time of game playing. You couldn't stand to look at it very, very long because that 40 hertz just would give you enough flicker that you would get tired. You can do it with uh, projectors, uh, however, not many game players use projectors, so that's not really a viable source. <clears throat> so it really comes down to the 120 hertz monitors I mentioned before. Uh, and then you have two choices. You either have the 120 hertz monitor with shutter glasses, or you have the special IZ3D monitor, which is a basic uh, 60 hertz monitor, but it's actually two monitors in one. It's two, two actual LCD panels and your eyes are polarized to look at one panel or the other. It's a clever technique, and it's, it's reasonably priced as well. This is just a little uh, comparison of what uh, the two or three uh, choices are. I put crystal's eyes in, crystal eyes in there just to give you a reference point as to where we came from and to show you what the uh, basic concepts are. And you see it's pretty much the same, not much difference uh, in terms of what we're, we're accomplishing, we're basically, you know, closing off one eye and letting the other one look at the image. But you notice the pricing, and that's today's price, and um, uh, IZ, IZ3D's price is the price of the monitor and, and the polarized glasses. Uh, the price there for 199 to 499, that's just the monitor. So if you want to get the NVIDIA glasses, you have to pay a few dollars extra for that.